Welcome everyone to uh, to this uh, event and lecture. This is um, an event organized within the framework of the UNPOP project. Its title is Emotion, Identities and Populism and is part of a series of uh, seminars and lectures that uh, are delivered by, especially by project consultants. And we are, we are honored to have with us today, Emmy Eklund, who is one of the project consultants. And um, I'm going to briefly introduce her before uh, leaving the floor for her talk. We will have also time for debate at the end of uh, her presentation, uh, which should last roughly uh, 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you are welcome to put forward your questions directly unmuting yourself later on uh, and uh, or writing in the chat. So Emmy Eklund is a, a senior lecturer in politics at Cardiff University. And she was lecturer in Spanish and international politics at King's College, London, besides other position. She holds a PhD in politics from Manchester, uh, the University of Manchester, um, and her international education also includes a master in at the University of uh, Bremen in Germany and a BA in at the University of Lund in Sweden. Her research interests are located um, in the interface between European politics and political and social theory. Namely, uh, she works on social and protest movement and political parties on the left, left-wing populism in Southern Europe and its responses to nationalism, resistance to European integration from the left, the role of social media for political action, our emotions and affect uh, influence the way we think about political identities and democratic theory, democratic theory and new conceptions of political subjectivity. She uses the radical democratic framework to further out understanding of democracy in Europe to challenge to our current liberal order but also the possibilities for democratic reform. She is also a regular contributor for media outlets such as BBC, CNN, Sky News, CNBC, Swedish National Radio, Newsweek, and others. She is a reviewer for uh, uh, Political Studies Review, Politics, Manchester University Press, the Level Home Trust, and Bristol University Press. Among her main books, she is author of Emotions, Protests, Democracy, Collective Identities in Contemporary Spain, Routledge 2019. And she is co-editor of uh, The Populist Manifesto, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2020, co-edited by Andy Knott, and uh, Politics of Anxiety, published as well by Roman and Littlefield in 2017 and co-edited with Andrea Zernik and Emmanuel Pierre Guitert. Um, she has written uh, several articles and chapters and I am very pleased to have her with us today and to deliver this very interesting, uh, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting speech. <laughs> so I leave you the floor, Emmy. The floor is yours and thank you very much for being with us. Right, thank you for that very uh, lovely uh, introduction, Cristiano. Um, I think you've covered everything that I've ever done. So that's great. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know uh, if it works and if it doesn't work, just shout at me. Um, so we'll see here. Um, so hopefully you can see it yeah, now. I see it uh, full screen. Great, That's Thanks. perfect. Uh, I'm glad. So today uh, I'm going to present a little bit of a uh, selection of uh, conclusions that I've drawn in my research uh, over the past few years, which are largely relating to the role of emotions in politics and how emotions relate to the creation of political identities 
and how emotions most importantly relate to the concept of populism because that's sort of my favorite topic of all times and I can talk about it forever uh, I often have to tell this to my students that if I veer into this topic they have to kind of pull me out of it because it's something that I'm uh, I'm very passionate about um, which is an apt thing to say so I'm going to change slides now I uh, hope you can uh, can you see my next slide sure Right. Sometimes it doesn't change the same way it does for you as it does for me. So I just wanted to double check. So um, what will I be covering uh, with you today? So we'll be kindly uh, given very free reigns uh, by Cristiano to present uh, what I think is important. And I thought we could uh, have a look at the following. So first of all, uh, I'm interested in the framing of emotions in political and social theory, and particularly in populism studies. So I'm going to spend a, a good while characterizing this field of study uh, and how emotions, in my view, are often treated very unfairly and how it's also a very political way that we treat emotions. So when people talk about emotional actors in politics, they're not doing so just from a neutral viewpoint, but they are doing so with a very strong political agenda. And this is uh, happening in politics in general, but it's also happening very strongly in academia. And I think this is, as researchers, we have to, um, take heed of this and we need to engage with how our research is politicized and serves a political purpose intentionally or unintentionally sometimes so that's my the first part uh, of my lecture today trying to understand how emotions are framed and how that framing is quite problematic in many ways um and because it is a bit problematic <laughs> from my point of view, I uh, propose that by using the theories of Ernesto Laclau, uh, of which some of you may be familiar, um, uh, but if you're not, that's also fine. I will, I'm going to go through sort of the main points. Uh, but I argue that if we take Laclau's lessons on emotions and politics, to be the sort of a good framework to understand things this was will enable us to sort of circumvent this problematic framing of emotions in political discourse and that Laclau's theory is often better suited for analysis of emotions than many other political theories. So I'm I'm a staunch Laclaudian, and uh, if you're not, that's fine. We can debate it at the end. Uh, but I I find it very convincing, uh, and I hope uh, you will too. And I think um, uh, importantly, and what I'm going to spend some time doing is why explaining why a theory of populism and why when we need to understand populism in particular, we need to look very closely at affect. So affect is slightly different from how we conceptualize emotions, and I'm going to explain uh, how that those two are different, and why we need to think about affect instead of emotions, because that is going to help us uh, understanding these politicized uh, ways that we think about populism. And towards the end of this presentation, I would like to point to what I uh, consider to be a very closely related field when researching emotions and populism. And that is what I call the sort of focus on praxis or practice uh, over the sort of logos uh, focus that is often the case in political science that maybe in order to understand the emotional aspects of populism we need different research methods and we need different ways of thinking about populism and this relates back to how um, emotions are highly politicized and i'm going to argue in the end that populism, and I want you to think about this throughout my whole <laughs> whole lecture, if possible, that populism as a concept is performative, that it doesn't, it's not neutral, and it's not just a, an analytical category, it is a highly normative concept, and it's used very normatively, very much by political commentators, right, but also in, um, in research. So this is the sort of overall framing 
uh, of my talk today. So hopefully we can get through all of these bits uh, in time because some of them are a bit theoretically dense. <laughs> so um, we'll see if that transpires uh, in the end. Uh, and just to say, if you're further interested in these topics, like my book covers all of this pretty much in depth. Uh, and if you don't have uh, the money to buy a copy, just email me. I can like email you a PDF of it. I'm not very committed to a publisher uh, profit, but rather to knowledge. Uh, so I'm sure that that will be that will be nice. Okay, so let's let's start uh, with this sort of framing of populism. How do we frame emotions and populism uh, together? And there are lots and lots of ways here, uh, and there are lots of lots of discussions, and it's, it comes up quite a lot in the media. But there is, I think, often very little these terms actually mean, and what their mutual relation is. Um, and I argue, uh, in, along with um, uh, this sort of um, literature that comes from the sort of social uh, constructivist uh, idea of populism that these are often seen as either nominal or ordinal categories. So what do I mean by that? So it is basically trying to figure out research on emotions and populism, whether an actor is emotional or populist or to uh, what degree, so that's sort of an ordinal uh, aspect of it, an actor is emotional or populist. And what I think is uh, gets kind of lost in this discussion is what I mentioned before, uh, that this is quite a different, um, a different way of doing political science. So I would argue that populism, and especially its allegedly emotional component, it is a performative category. And here I follow very excellent research that I'll speak about in a minute uh, of how populism is hyped, how populism is not, is used widely without being defined, uh, etc. And by embracing Laclau's take that politics is hegemony is populism, we can understand that this idea between populism and non-populism and the emotional and rational is something which we um is kind we kind of need to embrace and i'll spend a little bit of time on this now this last point uh, so laclau is very controversial in this uh, idea because he sees populism not as some sort of isolated phenomenon but he thinks that it is a, the overarching way of understanding how politics is uh, done in society. It's not something which happens on the fringes. It's not something that we are just uh, taking um, as a, an extremist phenomenon, but it's something which goes on at the very core of any political uh, event. Uh, so these two points I find are sort of my overall uh, direction today. But this is not how many people see it in general. So how uh, people associate populism often with bad things, right? So populists are angry or populists are mad and they are also not very clever, apparently, uh, according to some people. Uh, so if you see this quote here from George Lakoff, they say, it says that they vote against their obvious self-interest, they allow bias, prejudice, and emotions to guide their decisions. And you can see that this is indicating that populists are actually, they don't have any idea what they're doing. They're a bit stupid. Uh, they, you have to be appalled by the way that they argue about things, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that this, it plays into a larger uh, or sort of quite damaging rhetoric around who belongs in politics and who doesn't. So here on the uh, left side of the slide, um, I draw parallels between how Hillary Clinton was portrayed during the uh, presidential election in the United States in 2016. 
So Hillary Clinton was also, she wasn't portrayed as angry or mad, but she was seen as incapable of actually providing decent governing because she was a woman, right? And, you know, she might be hormonal, she might be on her period, and what if she pressed the nuclear buttons while she was on her period? You know, not to mention that she was like 70 years old at the time and probably hadn't had a period for like 20 years. But I mean, you know, that's too much for American commentators to sort of think through menopause that that can't possibly happen. But the similarity between the framing of Hillary Clinton as incapable of governing and as populists as incapable of governing are related to the same problem. And here we can draw great insights from feminist research uh, on how women are portrayed as uh, too weak, too emotional, too irrational to actually ever provide any type of good governance populists are largely portrayed the same way which is interesting because they are also seen as like hyper masculine etc and we can talk about lots about this uh, later on um i'm not a gender scholar so i'm not an expert in this area but this is something which is uh, there's lots of excellent work out there but nevertheless populists are portrayed as the outsiders that are too mad and angry to actually come up with a decent way uh, of governing. The problem is that this is nothing new. This is something has been that has been going on in social and political theory for hundreds of years. <laughs> and the point is that it always serves the same purpose. Populists, or as was originally conceived of um, as the angry mad mob by 19th century French crowd theorists, they are a threat to our democratic order. But what we have to do here is that we have to situate why that happened in the 19th century with what is happening to contextually today. So when these scholars uh, like Taine, who argued that the rational faculties of individuals are lost in the hypno hypnosis of the crowd, or Gabriel Tard, who said that emotions indicate pathological behavior, you know, it's absolutely horrid, right? Uh, Gustave Le Bon is another high flyer here in this field who said that crowds are manipulated by demagogues and charismatic leaders. But this is not a sort of isolated 19th century uh, French phenomenon. This goes on and on in political science to this day. If you look into the 20th century, Schumpeter argued that citizens become primitives when engaging in politics. So regular people should not be partaking in it. And things can go wrong in regular people participate in politics. Like they may elect someone like Hitler <laughs> is often the argument, right? Um, but the context is vastly important here because we can draw similarities of what is happening in the late uh, 19th century, the 20th century and today. What happened then in the birth of crowd theory? Well, this is the rise of the workers' movement. This is the rise of the struggle for suffrage uh, amongst ordinary men, uh, because it was all men at the time, uh, men who did not own property, uh, men who worked the factories, uh, peasants, etc. And of course, the response in that moment is not to say, oh yeah, lovely, uh, please, uh, come on board, we are now going to develop a great democracy together. That is not the response of the governing elites at the time, but it's rather this crowd theoretical perspective. You use science in order to justify excluding ordinary people from the democratic process. What we have during this time is also the rise of the modern prison system. And if uh, anyone, if we read Foucault, we can read uh, how this is becoming excruciatingly important, right? It's not because criminality is increasing in the 19th century, it's because we are instituting a society of control um, in order to try to limit the impact of strikes, the impact of social unrest against different injustices in society. So this idea that people are crazy and therefore cannot participate in the democratic process is very old but it's still going very strong uh, if we are seeing what is uh, said today about populists and what was said about the workers movements about the 
uh, women's rights movement, but the civil rights movement, you name it, is the same type of logic. So um, this is sort of a little bit developed uh, during the 20th century. What we are seeing is a refinement of how we are going to balance this idea that we have a democratic society on the on one hand, but there are very strong forces that want to exclude democratic participation on the other. How do you sort of unite those two? Uh, and it becomes more uh, elaborate over time. So there is a break against this idea that you shouldn't allow any citizens to participate uh, in the democratic process. That becomes accepted, right? You should allow uh, citizens to participate. But there is still a bar on what good participation looks like. And that is rationality. So good democracy can only be achieved if actors are actually rational. You can only have a good um, if people are not crazy. So this bar and this limitation on democratic participation, it's still there. It's just a little bit less pronounced and a little bit sort of less in your face, exclusionary and sexist, racist, what have you. And social science at the time, and political science in particular, uh, are very much in favor of saying that we need to overcome the flaws of democratic participation of the past. So we need to make sure that el the elections of the Nazis, for instance, it doesn't happen. And why does that happen? Well, it means it's because some citizens that are not worthy of participation are participating. And we need to make sure that the democratic game is upheld to certain standards in order to ensure that we have uh, democratic uh, control. And this gives the rise to stuff like rational choice theory. Uh, and we're trying to just make sure that the rules of the game are such that we can ensure that um, democracy is functioning and that we don't follow into dictatorship, etc. But what um, is happening to analysis sort of research then during the 20th century is that emotions become completely absent from political analysis. It's only about how we can be rational and how we can make study how people are rational. And emotions are thought of being a little bit too difficult to study and too difficult to measure, which is funny because other concepts such as like class, which is notoriously difficult to measure if you ask me, has been studied into oblivion, right? So it, there is a little bit of a choice here in that emotions are not important and they're not desirable in politics. Uh, this is a perspective that absolutely remains. But what I think is important to discuss when we talk about uh, this sort of ideal liberal democratic society is that much scholarship during this time and unfortunately still to this day does not take racial exclusion into account and it's definitely the case for 20th century political science in Europe and uh, in the United States particularly and and why is it that we don't want to talk about this? So when we're talking about rational citizens and what, how, whether you vote in your own self-interest, etc., we do not talk about we do not talk about slavery. For instance, some of the biggest uh, theorists of our time uh, in oh, sorry, now I clicked further on, biggest theorists of our time on liberal democracies, such as John Rawls, Robert Nosek, etc., do not mention race. They discuss justice in the United States without discussing racial relations, uh, up until some of them sort of discuss it very recently, but it's not, not really uh, a very concerted effort. So, I think it's important to see that liberal democracy at its very core is based on a very exclusionary logic. The Enlightenment was not some sort of uh, universe of, of paradise where democratic rights and equality was ensured. This is absolutely historically uh, inaccurate. And Charles Mills, uh, who's a fantastic um, political philosopher, uh, has written The Racial Contract, has made some 
great points about how racial division and how that you have some people are worth more than other others is actually what made liberal democracy possible in the first place and that the european democratic state has developed so closely in tandem with colonial conquest and with racial thinking that you cannot overlook such exclusionary uh, behaviors. And if you do that, and if you see at what type of justifications are made in liberal democratic theory about how an ideal citizen should look, you really have to think very closely as well about emotions and about rationality. Because emotions and rationality, they play into this very division between who is a good democratic citizen and who is a bad citizen. And here you have gender coming into the mix. You have race coming into the mix, where the white man is often thought of as more intelligent, more rational, more educated than women, uh, people of color, um, and young people, etc. So this whole civilizational logic that liberalism is based on and that democratic theory is based on is very closely connected to these strongly exclusionary behaviors and they are often justified with reference to emotions. So when we talk about emotions, populism and democracy, we must see all of these discussions in light of this, that we cannot forget what ha has happened historically in Europe. And I think that it's important to just go back to the uh, classical texts when that are so much heralded in European academia and in society more generally. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have um, gone through a full education in uh, many different European universities without being directly subjected to the very problematic thoughts uh, of these thinkers. So, for instance, uh, if you uh, look at quotes from people that we are read time and time again as political scientists is actually pretty awful <laughs> the stuff that they are saying particularly with reference to emotions race and gender so it's basically these texts are peddling this myth that european whites are a civilized population and that anyone else is a savage but that the savagery, it's not only external, it's also internal, right? And this is what Hobbes meant with the state of nature, that we all have it inside of us and we need to overcome it in order to reach uh, a better society. So Europeans have managed to get beyond the state of nature, which demonstrates their innate rationality. Uh, uh, Rousseau, for instance, argued in Discourses on Inequality that at metallurgy and agriculture were unknown to the savages of America who have therefore always remained savages. If you have had any education in the history of South America, you will of course know that metallurgy in the Aztec and Inca empires were absolutely advanced, much more so than any comparable continent at the time. Uh, so it's just factually incorrect but it's still something that is thought of as, as true uh, by many people today. If we look further on uh, to a thinker such as Kant, who is the very father, I would say, of the concept of race, he argues that so fundamental is the difference between the black and white races of man, it appears to be as great in regard to mental capacities as in color. So we would say that it is the color of your skin determines your mental capacities. Uh, and he goes on to say that clear proof of what a Negro said was stupid was that this fellow was quite black from head to foot. So it's there is no escape really from the uh, racial thinking of Kant uh, here. And to say that it actually really matters for the way that democracy is developed. Uh, because what it really uh, is is kind of lacking here is that there would be any type of salvation or that we could sort of educate our way uh, out of this we can't people are 
stupid, not because they lack education, but because they are uh, just innately so. And it's uh, definitely the case that you are incapable of sort of moving beyond this. And this dip, um, sort of uh, capacity to rationality is really absolutely core when in European democratic theory and particularly in liberalism, which of course has very great consequences for how we view emotions. And full personhood, so being a citizen of a state, is absolutely dependent on race uh, in the classical texts that we defer, refer to time and time again. So uh, I would say that one way out of this uh, is to uh, try to understand how emotions and populism work in Europe is to look uh, at great thinkers uh, who before us have obviously uh, thought a lot about this. Uh, Quijano, who I draw a lot upon in my work, uh, develops this idea of the col uh, coloniality of power and how uh, rationality is included in what he calls a colonial matrix of power. And I think this is also very crucial to understanding how populism is uh, portrayed in this idea of some subjects are worthy of political participation and some are not. And then we have thinkers such as uh, Mignola, who has taken this on and basically copied quite a lot of what Quijano has been saying uh, and uh, argues that this idea of thinking outside of what the colonial matrix of power is and basically trying to break with this hegemony of rationality is the only way to resist um, this um, coloniality of power. So you, ha in order to sort of reach emancipation in order to have an equal society, we much think, must think about how coloniality and rationality are so tightly interlinked and how they are also in uh, research on populism today. So um, if we come back to our contemporary times and see how populism research relates to all of these thoughts, I think it becomes quite obvious that there is a lot of populism research that is very closely connected with what you might call the early crowd theorists, where emotions is something completely negative, where the mad mob is a threat to democracy, and where unwanted elements should be kept on the outside. Sigmund Bauman, before he died, he said about the post-austerity movements um, in from 2008 onwards, uh, or sort of post-crisis anti-austerity movements, he said that if emotion is a good tool for destruction, it's a terrible tool for construction. People from all kinds of classes and conditions um, unite on the squares and shout the same slogans. They are all in agreement regarding what they dislike, but you will get 100 different responses if you ask them what they want. <laughs> so he does not agree at all uh, with that emotion can be a uniting factor for a social movement uh, or for a populist party, or that this should be a positive development for democracy, not at all. If you look further to um, other thinkers, such as Jan, Jan van Müller, who said that populism is a degraded form of democracy and that the emotional sort of pathological behaviors of uh, populists is, is definitely threatening. Niall Ferguson, historian, has said that the flammable ingredient for populism is, of course, the demagogue. So the demagogue here, of course, is seen as someone who's also inciting emotion, making people um, oblivious to facts, uh, etc. And it's playing again on this emotion, ra uh, rationality, uh, dualism, that good politics is rational, bad politics is emotional. And we see uh, what that has done uh, historically. So I guess having depicted some of these uh, trends in the field, I guess the big question remains here of whether we can save emotions. <laughs> can we move beyond this, this, these patterns? Can we try to think about emotions in a different way? Is there anything positive about it? Can we save democracy? Is it all lost? Uh, you know, these are the big questions of our time uh, that we need to think about. So I think that there has been a positive development in populism studies uh, regarding the uh, 
emotions in the uh, in the past few years, and we've seen an increased commitment uh, with uh, emotions in populism studies. But what I will say, though, is that even though this research is very welcome and often very well executed, um, it is often trying to answer this question that I posed in the beginning, whether populists are more emotional than regular politicians, uh, what type of emotions are they exhibiting, or whether they are convincing due to their uh, populist appeals. So um, I think that this is something that um, is quite uh, important, but is it enough to sort of break this uh, emotionality, rationality, dualism? Is it enough to really salvage uh, or counter this very negative history of emotions in politics? Um, and I would say that there is still within the field of populism studies quite a strong commitment to rationality. And in some of these studies, there is an implicit assumption that uh, an emotional politician is vastly different from what is called a rational politician, and that there is a very strong difference between the two. And I'm not so sure that we can make this very strong distinction. Uh, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, so, for instance, um, Jan van der Miller, but also people like Pippa Norris, uh, etc., and Kass Mudder, uh, they take this idea that reason and rationality is necessary for democratic functioning. Uh, and Pippa Norris has written lots of work about this before she even started working uh, on populism particularly. I mean, Kasmude is also of the opinion that populism lacks intellectual refinement and consistency, which I think again speaks to a certain uh, assumption that it's not as rational, not as intellectual as proper politics or mainstream politics. So what I would say is that um, they, this assumption that populism and populists are emotional and that they are more emotional than your average politician, it, that assumption performs exclusion. That assumption in itself speaks to this very long history of exclusionary politics based on emotional grounds that we have seen uh, hit people uh, of ethnic minorities, women, young people, etc. So uh, just to continue here uh, in the field, uh, I would say that one way of looking at this um, is to uh, try to think about populism not so much as an ideology, but rather as a discourse, which is my something that you have come across before. Um, so I would argue that this my work in this paper that I uh, set to read ahead of this session uh, is largely in agreement with that populism is indeed discursive. It's something that should focus on the social, cultural and linguistic factors. But we need to also think about how the very language around populism in itself serves an exclusionary uh, purpose. So I think that even the people who use discursive or sociocultural ideas of populism also play into this uh, stereotype that rational politics is better than emotional politics. Like Pierre Ostigui, for instance, he argues that populism is a fight between the high and the low. And the low, obviously, which is the populist, because it couldn't possibly be the high, um, it makes use of raw or improper forms of politics. Uh, and it often says that it, it's impolite, it is transgressive, all of these adjectives that have typically uh, been leveraged against women, against uh, ethnic minorities, etc. It's the same, same type of language. Um, ben Moffat, who has also become this rising star, right, of uh, thinking about populism, uh, he argues that populism is a political style uh, and that the low in populist performances, it, it can be seen in the use of slang, swearing, political incorrectness, being overly demonstrative and colorful in language. I mean, that this, these are, again, the same type of adjectives that are used against women, um, um, 
typically also uh, non-white populations get a lot of this. Uh, and I would say that uh, this Moffitt then positions that against what he finds the higher politics, which is um, which is rigidness, rationality, composure, use of technocratic language. So we are seeing that in populism studies, emotions are still it's seen as something wrong. It's still seen as something which is not desirable, which is not part uh, of the mainstream. And I think this low is really equated with the limited capacity to rationality, which, uh, in my view, is problematic. So I would argue that we need to follow a different uh, strand of work. Uh, there are some excellent uh, references that are put on the screen now, uh, which uh, are arguing that populism is not an analytical category whatsoever. It is used for political purposes only. So uh, there is also other literature on anti-populism, uh, but it doesn't focus specifically on the sort of emotional component. So I would argue that um, the challenge is how we can understand this emotionality as being and how we must endeavor to break this very exclusionary language that we are seeing against populists and that we are seeing also against women, non-Europeans, young people, etc. And my way of doing this is to use Laclau. And the, it's a very simple uh, lesson that I draw from Laclau, and that is that all politics is equally emotional. That there is no politics that is more emotional than others. And therefore, we can't make this assumption that populists are in any way different from other political actors. The only way that we are saying that they are different is because we don't want them inside our political sphere. So uh, emotions in this way is just a euphemism for someone who doesn't belong in politics. And uh, the idea is to call someone a populist is also then to say you don't belong in politics. And it has little to do with what these people actually stand for. Uh, and I would say that this is the very basis of Laclau, that it doesn't matter really uh, what you stand for because all political identities are formed through articulation. So there are no, no essentialist political ideologies. We can't capture ideologies. All we have is political identities that are expressed in different points in time, in different contexts. And this, is, is a very generalist argument. And Laclau has been criticized for this. And uh, he's been criticized particularly for saying that all politics is potentially populist. So even if you're Tony Blair or if you're Angela Merkel, you do politics in a similar way to those populists that you absolutely despise. And this is, and people go like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not right. We need to think of the ideological differences. And to that, uh, Laclau says that, well, those ideological differences are only constructed in the very moment, but the very process and the way through which those differences are constructed is the same. And that process is highly emotional. No politics happens without what he calls effective investment in an empty signifier. And that investment is what is common to all of us. Whether you're on the left, you're on the right, uh, up and down, it doesn't matter. Uh, and therefore, it's always to some degree a populist articulation because that's the only way, according to Laclau, to construct a political identity. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether, or this idea that populists should be more emotional than other uh, politicians is absolutely irrelevant, right? Because that doesn't, no political identities can be constructed without this effective investment. It's absolutely impossible. And if we take this to the logical conclusion, it enables us to move away from this idea that, oh yeah, um, look at how many swear words is exhibited by politician X in comparison to poli politician Y. That doesn't matter at all to Laclau. What matters is that how those identities that are constructed perform different forms of exclusion. 
they're always trying to get some people on the inside and some people on the outside. And that happens whether you're a centrist or whether you are a full on communist, it doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, the important bit, I guess, here to, to argue is that some people would say like, oh, yeah, but if all politics is populist, what's the use of this theory? It doesn't make it completely useless if we can't distinguish between different types of politicians. But I would say that what it enables us to do is to take to shed light on those people that try to erect sort of imaginary differences in our political sphere. And those are not visible if we don't take this assumption to be true, that all politicians and all political identities are constructed in the same way and in a potentially populist way. So it's not that it's lacking analytical utility, it's just that we are shedding light, we are focusing on a different area than perhaps other theories are doing. So um, sometimes people use Laclau in a way that it becomes very formulaic uh, and uh, where you sort of try to justify and say like, oh yeah, but this exclusion is a good one, etc. But I would say that this, this is not a necessary development. It's not necessarily, I think, what Laclau meant. Uh, and I don't think that he would say that antagonistic relations in society are desirable, just that, that they are inevitable. Uh, and so I think that's, that's a different uh, way of thinking about it. So uh, how I will put a little bit of addition here to Laclau at the end, saying that even though I think it's very useful in understanding how uh, political identities are not different, depending on whether you're a, a populist or a non-populist, um, it definitely needs more work in understanding how exclusionary behavior in terms of race and gender has affected politics, mainstream politics and populist politics in particular. So I often get this question at this stage where people say, okay, so basically you're saying that uh, the uh, we women's movement is subject to the same exclusion as, as Trumpians. And I think that's absolutely not what I'm saying. Uh, this is not a logical conclusion. Rather, I would say that it's a the t types of arguments that are used against Trump are also used against women. But that is not to say that people who vote for Trump or who vote for um, uh, Vox in Spain, etc., that they are subject to the same exclusions as women generally or people of color. So there is no equation mark there. And we definitely need to historicize the exclusions that um, are happening in populist politics uh, and it's not to say that that they are identical, uh, definitely not. So uh, in the last few minutes here, uh, I think if I'm not running out of time too much, um, I just wanted to make a few methodological observations because often when we talk about emotions, we talk about a different type of research. Um, it's not always very evident that we can see the emotional aspect of politics by just reading text. Actually, it's pretty difficult, I would say, uh, to see how emotions are tra transpire in political life. And I think that therefore we need to also look at other forms of communication uh, and uh, particularly focus on practice in addition to only looking at rhetoric, political programs, etc. Um, so I would say that populist practice uh, it's not only present in electoral politics, but it's also very deeply embedded in cultural practices and, and the everyday. And again, we have we have fantastic things to learn from, from feminist research. Um, and we can see how visual and online culture are starting to feature more prominently in populism research. Um, and I just put a picture here of Boris Johnson waving around a smoked fish. And I mean, it smells horrific. It's this smoked fish that British people are really attached to emotionally. It's called a kipper. And he just stood on a podium waving the smoked fish around like a mad person, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, it had huge success. Well, he said that the reason for Brexit is so that we can save the kipper. And it didn't matter really what sort of the argument was here around 
how fishing rights in the UK and whether that was included in the agreement with the EU, etc. The only thing that mattered was that the emotional attachment to this fish, which people eat in their everyday lives, and it's a sort of regular staple, uh, that that became associated with Brexit. And that in order to save this fish and your everyday life, your everyday culture, you had to vote Brexit. And I think that those types of practices is something that populism research is beginning to look at uh, a lot more over the past few years. So I think that uh, and emotions form part of that, right? And we are seeing also how uh, effective investment in, uh, which I've talked a lot about obviously so far, but just to give you a couple of other um, tips for literature uh, in, in these areas on how uh, effective investment is basically a very good way of understanding uh, populist research and the struggle for political identities. And I think that the third point that I want to make here about practice and praxis is uh, materiality. And I think it's a, bit, a little bit of a um, return to this discussion about class, which has become very much, I definitely see populism as a discourse, but that doesn't mean that populism doesn't have material factors. Uh, so it's by seeing populism as a discourse, we are also including material factors such as income, uh, other sort of uh, housing, etc. So materiality, it's not something that we need to separate out from our analysis, it's rather something that should be included. Similarly, I think that it's really important to look at policy, for instance, and not only electoral programs, but what is actually being um, said at the end of the day. And here I've done a lot of research on Podemos in Spain, where <laughs> Podemos has argued a lot. And of course, they are in a co uh, coalition with the PSOE in Spain, but they are actually implementing policies that uh, perhaps don't always align very well with what they say rhetorically. And I think this, when we t talk about practice and emotions, I think this is also an, an important uh, matter. So the methods and study of emotions and populism are hugely important. This is not to, I don't want to end the conversation here. I don't have the final answers. I just think that this is something that we really, really need to think about. So in order to conclude here, so I don't keep you for too long, um, uh, I argued largely then that if we assume La Clau's effective approach to populism, this division between emotion and reason becomes first obsolete, but also becomes very politically charged. Uh, if we think that any identity is an effective identity, whether you're a mainstream politician or not, uh, so the idea that we should label populist po politics as more emotional, as less civilized, etc., it is an extremely political point to make. It's not an analytical point to make. Uh, and that's what becomes so acute, I think, both in research and public debate. So this labeling of populism as too emotional, it carries these very overt, but also oblique traces of rationalism. And rationalism, I would argue, is one of the great injustices of our time, uh, that it has justified colonial conquest it has justified gender oppression and has justified all sorts of very, very detrimental forms of exclusion that we need to question. And so when we study populism and emotions, it's important that we don't fall into the same trap of rationalism, but that, that we treat it respectfully uh, and try to see politics for what it is and not for uh, whether it is on the inside uh, or on the outside. So I think that emotions, it should be considered just, um, it's sometimes used as just another facade for resistance to popular participation. It's just an argument that, oh yeah, they're emotional, therefore we should try to keep them on the outside. And I, we need a deeper understanding of why do these people want to keep this other group on the outside? Why is that? It's not only because they're emotional, because of something else. And we need some, some sort of deeper analysis here. And we need to also um, understand how this conceptual rigidity around populism and, and, and rationality particularly, how that performs a certain 
uh, political agenda. So uh, that's basically everything from me. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And I will now uh, give the ball back to Cristiano and then I hope we can have some time for, for questions as well. Thank you so much.